Many who have been uh, traveling are returned, and some of the ones that weren't traveling are now traveling. Now, uh, Lisa and I bring you greetings from the St. Andrews Road Church of Christ. They uh, kindly invited Lisa and I down there, and I spoke Wednesday night in their summer series. Very nice people, and uh, really enjoyed the visit with uh, brethren down in Columbia. I don't like Columbia, but it was nice to see the brethren down there. <clears throat> Columbia is always hot, yes. really yes. hot, because it sits in a bowl, and uh, the result is that it's a really hot place. But uh, glad to have all of you that were traveling back again, and have, glad that you're safe with us. Turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2, good morning. Beginning in verse 4, we're going to try to get through um, verse 12 this morning in our study of um, 1 Peter. Uh, Peter has pointed out two major things about the identity of the people of God so far as we've gotten through verse 3 of chapter 2. And number one, the people of God are grounded in their salvation. And Peter spent a lot of time, verses 3 through 12, talking about that. And then number two, they uh, expressed in the kind of life that we're to lead with each other, talking about brotherly love. Now, today, he's going to begin using uh, a lot of Old Testament Illusions, illustrations. He's going to take Old Testament ideas and make a transition into the New Testament and show us that a lot of the things that the prophets talked about are what have come to fruition or come to pass for New Testament Christians. So uh, that's what he's going to be using a lot today. I think three or four of the verses that he uses come directly from either Psalms or Isaiah. So 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, coming to him as a living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious. Um, The idea of a living stone is weird, isn't it? Unless you lived during the time of the late 60s and early 70s when we had pet rocks. <laughs> That's the first thing I thought of. I guess it just me being weird, but it's the first thing I thought of. Pet rocks, you know, that's kind of a contradiction in terms. And living stone. So Peter shifts his description of Jesus from a lamb without blemish, where he ended in Uh, the last verse, verse 3 of chapter 2, to a living stone. So actually he's going to use a number of different things to talk about what Jesus was and what we are as well. The word living is an allusion to Christ's resurrection. The word stone is allusion that Jesus is our foundation. He's referred to as a stone, a rock. He's called the chief stone, the chief cornerstone, depending on what scripture you look at. And the resurrection of Jesus enabled him to be the foundation of the church and the foundation, of course, of our beliefs. Uh, Living stone is a metaphor from Isaiah 28 and probably, although it's not as easy to see in Psalm 118, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, This is the New King James. A precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Notice what he says. Stone, foundation, stone, precious cornerstone, foundation. Whoever believes in him will not act hastily. So this is from Isaiah. Uh, Now, Peter says that Jesus was a stone that was rejected by men. So his point is, with the rejection, that Christ is the chosen one of God, and in the end, he is going to be the one who prevails, even though the Jews rejected him, even though uh, some Gentiles rejected him. 
He is going to prevail in the end, so it's to our advantage to believe in the chosen one. I like Luke chapter nine and verse 22. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. Here's that idea that Peter's bringing in of rejection. Rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes to be killed and raised up on the third day. So Luke 9 is Jesus' own prophecy of his death, burial, and resurrection. But Peter uses it in the term of rejection here. These Jews that should have accepted Jesus with open arms are rejecting him. And it says chosen, and the word chosen is the, uh, the word electos, so we could use uh, elect just as easily. The New King James translators use the word chosen, but chosen by God and precious. Boy, let me tell you, if, uh, if you can't get a sermon out of that, you ain't been called to preach. You know what I mean? Chosen by God and precious. Jesus is precious to us, and humans may reject Jesus but God gives him great honor. So we need to remember that some people will never accept Jesus. That's the realization. When you go back and you look in Luke and you talk about the parable of the sower, only uh, one out of four people actually respond favorably to the gospel and become Christians. You know, there's four different uh, kinds of uh, things that happen to the seeds and only 25% of them actually bear fruit. So a lot of people are going to reject Jesus, but it's going to be to their own demise when they do that. Notice he says, rejected indeed by men. This is one of those instances where uh, the word indeed is really not necessary, but translators sometimes add a word if they think it makes it clearer. But uh, rejected by men, rejected indeed by men, I I don't see the difference myself. Um, Compare Matthew and Mark and Luke where Jesus himself quotes Psalm 118 and applies this to the rejection of the stone uh, by the builders to the Sanhedrin's conduct toward him. The Sanhedrin feared that Jesus and his uprising was going to cause Rome to come down hard on the Jews. And so they said, uh, what the Sanhedrin, um, uh, Caiaphas said, one man must die for the country. And of course, he's referring to Jesus. Notice Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So Peter is strong on this idea of some people are going to reject Jesus and yet uh, Jesus is chosen by God. First Peter chapter two and verse five, you also as living stones are being built up to a spiritual house. Watch the, uh, the things that he says here. Built up to a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, I have said this before, that worship is the most important thing that we do. I've had people debate me on that and say, no, evangelism is the most important thing we do, and I don't believe that. Evangelism is important. Evangelism needs to take place. We need to be telling other people about Jesus and let them decide whether they're going to accept him or reject him or not. But the most important thing we do as Christians is worship. And I think that that really comes through with this particular passage, a spiritual house. This is what we are as living stones. Jesus is the living stone. We are the living stones. He's the cornerstone. We build on top of him, being built as a spiritual house. We should be spiritual people. A holy priesthood, uh, we offer sacrifices. That's what priests do. And notice to offer up spiritual sacrifices, ones that are acceptable to God. So Jesus is first called the living stone, And then we're called living stones ourselves. We live because we're connected to Jesus as the source of life. Don't you like that sentence? We are called as living stones and we live because we're connected with Jesus and the source of life. If you live in this life and you've accepted Jesus, you obey him and you live uh, faithfully, 
You not only live in this life, but you live in the afterlife as well because Jesus is the living stone. Um, so close is the relationship between Christians and Christ that Peter uses the same metaphor, metaphor to describe both, living stone and living stones. So, yes. So I have a question. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We're going to talk about it as we come up. I promise, okay? We've got coming slides on that. You're sharp and ahead of us. That's the way it is. Yeah. Got you, got you covered here in just a minute. Uh, it's in union with him, uh, Jesus, that we live. As stones of a building, we are of no use, really, except that we occupy our proper places in the building. Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation, and then we build on top of that. And that's what makes us important because we're building on what Jesus has already done for us through his living his life, dying his death, and then being raised from the dead. <clears throat> okay, we're built up to a spiritual house. Jesus is using Christians to build the church into a community of believers. That's what he means by spiritual house. Uh, we are a community of believers, and as believers, we offer sacrificial worship to God because we are priests as well. So Peter is going to shift his metaphor three times in this. First of all, he says, living stones. Then he's going to call us a spiritual house. Then he's going to call us a holy priesthood. All three of them apply to us describing Christians who have believed uh, in Jesus. So we become a community of believers. Um, you can make that community like a congregation is a community of believers, but you can expand that out worldwide to the universal church as well. Every person who is a, 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 a follower of, of Jesus Christ who has obeyed his will and done what he's supposed to do, all of us together become a community of believers. And um, what, did, uh, what God does in us together is important he is building something out of us together. All of us together offering our spiritual worship as a spiritual house. That's what God wants. That's what he decides. So he's building something with us as a result of what Jesus has done. So this spiritual house includes all obedient believers. If you're obedient to God and you're living faithfully, but it refers specifically in this context, I believe, to the Roman provinces that Peter talks about in 1 Peter 1 verse 1, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He's talking to them. So in context, this shows clearly that Peter understood the metaphor of Christ in Matthew 16 and verse 18. If you remember Matthew verse 16 verse 18 says what? Okay. You are Peter. You are, who was saying it? You are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades. Please don't use the King James. The word Gehenna is not there. It's not hell. It doesn't say the gates of hell. It says the gates of Hades. It's a completely different place going on there. We have to be careful about those kind of things. But Matthew 16, 18 talks about um, the fact that you are Peter. Upon this rock, I'm going to build whose church? I'm going to build my church. Not going to be anybody else's church. I'm going to build my church. And so Peter uh, used this metaphor uh, of uh, uh, Matthew 16, verse 18. And remember, Jesus is the one talking to Peter in Matthew chapter 16. So isn't it interesting when you study the writings of some of these apostles that were with Jesus his entire life? as far as his teaching life is three years, it's very interesting to see how they recollect, they remember back to what happened. And of course, the Holy Spirit is helping them in their writing uh, to make sure that they write down the correct message that God wants. But uh, the point is, Peter was there. He's the one who says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Um, and so he's remembering back to that and now he's talking to us and he's saying, you're a spiritual house, these five provinces, but 
Uh, he also talks about all of us as a universal church. It's not just us in this congregation, it's all obedient believers, okay? <clears throat> um, as much as God chose Israel, so the church is also the chosen. As much as Israel had a priesthood, so Christians are a holy priesthood. And ourselves, of course, we have no priestly authority, but we have it because of Jesus. Uh, I really like that sentence a lot. What we have, everything that we do have, we owe to Jesus. And as much as Israel had sacrifices, so Christians offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So he's going back and he's comparing the Old Testament to the New Testament. They were chosen, we're chosen. There was a priesthood, we're a priesthood. They offered sacrifices, we offer spiritual sacrifices. So Peter's general idea is this. Christianity is in no way inferior to Judaism. Now that's gonna make some people mad. Remember, Paul would go into synagogue sometimes and they would not accept him. He'd be driven out of, sometimes beaten as a result of teaching in the synagogue because a lot of people felt that Judaism was superior to Christianity. But Peter says, you know what? When you make the comparison between what they were and what we are, Peter, you know, the idea is Christianity is in no way inferior to Judaism at all. And y'all need to remember that. And so he brings that point to us. So as New Testament Christians, we can offer up our sacrificial worship of songs of praise, of prayers, of giving our money, giving of our talents as well, uh, preaching, teaching, and the Lord's Supper. All of those things become our spiritual worship because we are, as people, a spiritual house. Don't think of it as a building. Think of it as us being built up as a spiritual house. So we're a spiritual house. We offer sacrificial worship, and this is how we do it. And we don't do it just as a corporate a congregation on Sunday, we do it then, but we can offer sacrifice of praise, uh, worship to God anytime. You can be driving along in your car. I won't recommend that you pray with your eyes closed, but you can pray uh, whenever you go along. You know, you can sing praises. Sometimes um, a couple of songs that I really learned to love from a song leader down in Williston, and sometimes I'll just start singing that song. Uh, it just reminds me of Jesus and I, my heart is just filled with uh, uh, the, the feelings, good feelings about Jesus and what he's done and I just start singing. You can do that. That's offering spiritual praise to God when you're doing that. Um, of course, on Sundays, we partake uh, of the uh, Lord's Supper as a corporate body and we're remembering what Jesus did for us. But we can be using our talents. By using our talents, we're offering spiritual worship uh, to God. Uh, these young people who have put so much effort into our Vacation Bible School. Can I plug Vacation Bible School right now? Uh, starting on Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, we're going to have uh, uh, our Vacation Bible School. Going to be a lot of young people here, but we have an adult class as well. Uh, Martin is going to teach Wednesday night. I'm going to teach Thursday and Friday, and then Martin will teach on Saturday morning for the adult class. But, you know, that it, using of our talents in that way, that becomes a spiritual uh, kind of worship as well. Priests use their talents in that way. And uh, all the people that are teaching those classes and have put in the time and the study and the preparation, we really appreciate everything that you're doing. So uh, be sure and start on Wednesday night with us, 6 to 8. Uh, we have snacks. And on Saturday, we're going to have a barbecue. Isn't that a good thing? Except for it's probably going to be 100 degrees on Saturday. But you know what? We have a really nice air-conditioned fellowship hall we can eat in if we need to. You know, I've, I've never been in a building that has so much preparation. We have two Keurig machines and an ice maker. Are you kidding me? <laughs> First Peter 2 and verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture... Don't you love it when a writer from the New Testament says, this is contained in Scripture. What that means is, I'm going to go back and I'm going to refer to something that you're already familiar with. It's contained in Scripture, you know. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect that could be chosen, precious, and he who believes on him will by, by no means be put to shame. 
I really like, this is an interesting verse. Jesus, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, Psalm 118, the stumbling stone, Isaiah 8, the foundation stone, Isaiah 28, the stone of David, uh, and Daniel chapter 2, verses 35 and 45, and the rock that miraculously gave Israel water in the wilderness, 1 Corinthians 10, 4. That's all Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Look how many different ways Peter has used Old Testament, and in some instances, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, New Testament, things to realize what Jesus really is. Cornerstone, stumbling stone. So he's a cornerstone, building up spiritual house, but he's a stumbling stone to some people who reject him He's a foundation stone for the church, and yet he's the stone, uh, if you remember in Daniel, that uh, broke apart the, uh, uh, hit the feet and broke apart the, uh, the giant uh, uh, illusion that uh, Daniel was giving, talking about the coming kingdom of God. The rock that miraculously gave uh, water in the wilderness. So uh, Jesus is all of those things. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Uh, in the original context, Isaiah was speaking to the leaders of Israel who had just made a pact with Egypt in response to the threat of an invasion by Assyria. We actually studied this on Wednesday night in our, uh, in our Wednesday night class on Isaiah. So Isaiah points to a solid temple of an illustration of where the true strength of Israel was. And the true strength of Israel was in God was in God, not in alliances. So later rabbis understood this reference to the cornerstones being a scripture of the Messiah who would establish, uh, be established in Zion. But notice, the word apparently invented by Isaiah, cornerstone is a word that Isaiah uses and it's from uh, two other Greek words, akros and uh, gyanios. Uh, but the cornerstone is only used one other time, and that's by Paul in Ephesians. So the chief cornerstone, the only other New Testament example is with uh, Peter and Paul using that same word. Notice, the metaphor is rather a foundation stone. Peter and Paul make it the primary foundation stone to our structure of the church, in other words. We're a spiritual house. We're this uh, corporate body called the, the Lord's Church, and he uses this metaphor talking about we have built on what Jesus started as the chief cornerstone. So he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. I love this phraseology, by no means be put to shame. Um, in English, if you have a double negative, it can mean a positive. In Greek, a double negative means emphasis. It gives greater emphasis to whatever's going on. <clears throat> but notice, belief is the entry point where one begins to understand God's plan of redemption. We tell people, whenever we talk about uh, Jesus, the first thing you have to do is believe in him. That's the entry point. If you don't believe in Jesus, uh, there's no need to try to repent of sins. There's no need to confess Christ. And there's certainly no need to be baptized. If you don't believe in him, you're just getting wet. If you believe in him and you repented and you confess Christ and you're baptized, now you're getting wet, but you're also having the removal of your sins, the forgiveness of sins. Belief is the beginning point. You've got to get people to the point of believing. Once you get the entry point, now you can enter into people's lives and teach them. Notice what he says here, by no means. Um, this is emphatic in the Greek. Uh, the Lord Jesus assures the believer of ultimate victory. We can be assured that on the day Jesus comes back, if we have been faithful, we can sing victory in Jesus. Amen? By no means. Double negative in Greek. He's made it emphatic. The Lord Jesus assures the believer of ultimate victory. We just have to believe that. We need to believe it. We need to understand that this is what Jesus has done for us. He's given us. Although we may have all kinds of trials and tribulations and temptations in this life, if we will stay faithful, the ultimate victory is going to be ours because Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Um, this idea of put to shame means to be dishonored or disgraced. 
Um, the more we orientate or orient ourselves to the grace of God, the less we will experience shame. You know, whenever we, we sin and then we step back and we look at our life and say, oh, man, I really wish I hadn't said that, really wish I hadn't done that, whatever it is, and we feel shame. If we have a conscience, we feel shame. Peter says, by relying on Jesus, if we will begin to control, we talked about in one class about disciplining our minds. If we'll begin to control what we say and control our actions, the things that we do, how we act, how we go about our daily lives, if we'll do that, then we'll feel no shame or a lot less shame. We need to realize that God's grace saving us, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for grace you've been saved through faith, that entry point, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. So by our being obedient believers, being those living stones, building on that cornerstone that is Jesus, we're not gonna be put to shame or we're gonna be put to shame a lot fewer times because we've relied on God, the blood of Jesus, and the grace that comes as a result of that, okay? <clears throat> First Peter 2, 7. Therefore, you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, he's going to make a play on words here, and he does this twice in these final verses of chapter, um, chapter two. He's gonna make a uh, comparison between believing and being disobedient. John does this a lot in the Gospel of John and in 1 John. He uses belief and obey disbelief and disobey as meaning the same thing. If you believe, then you obey. John 3.16, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he, help me out here, gave his only, that whoever believes in him. But then if you go down to John 3.36, and people forget about, they, everybody knows John 3.16, and they forget about John 3.36, which says, if you do not believe, but he uses the word obey there instead of believe, okay? Let's look at that for just a second. <clears throat> if you have your uh, Bibles. By the way, the, uh, I hope nobody gets mad at me, but I, I point out when translations are wrong because I do my study on those. John 3, 36. This is the New American Standard. New American Standard has it right. The New King James translates it wrong, and I don't know why, but they do. He who believes in the Son is eternal life, but he who does not obey, and I looked that up in uh, five different Greek versions. It is the word obey. It's not the word believe. The New King James uses the word does not believe, but it's not believe there. The word is, uh, that's used there is the word for obey. And I don't know why they don't translate it that way. But the point is, if we believe in Jesus, we can be saved, right? He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Peter is using this idea of believing and obeying as being interchangeable. So he says, therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, what? This is the chief cornerstone rejected by the disobedient and unbelieving. I'm using those terms interchangeably as well. Undeniably, Jesus is precious to those who believe. One way to know if a person is truly have biblical faith is Jesus actually precious to them. How do we treat things that are precious to us? We take care of them, we protect them. If you've got your great grandma's china that you only bring out for Thanksgiving, that is 
precious to you. And how do you put it up? Man, you've got that kind of uh, plastic bubble wrap that you put in between each plate as you've washed it carefully, put it back together again. All the cups, all the glasses, all of it. But it's precious to you, so you really take care of it. Peter says, biblical faith, if you actually have it, then Jesus is precious to you, and that's how you treat just Jesus as well in your own life. People will know. People that you work with, people who are your relatives, people in church, they will know whether Jesus is precious to you or not. So uh, we need to make sure that Jesus is precious to us in our lives. Notice what he says. The stone which the builders reject has become the chief cornerstone. This is very similar to uh, Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected become the chief cornerstone. Very similar kind of thing. The text was taken, this text was taken by the early church to be a prophecy of Jesus' rejection and death and his subsequent vindication. So he was rejected as the chief cornerstone, but when he was raised from the dead, he was vindicated because God raised him from the dead. <clears throat> All right, 1 Peter 2, 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Uh, they stumble being disobedient to the word which they have also appointed. Um, think, of it, think of it this way. Uh, Peter quotes uh, Isaiah 8, 14 and gives it new meaning. New Testament writers frequently use an Old Testament quotation to make their New Testament point concerning Jesus. He will be as a sanctuary, uh, spiritual house we think of as sanctuary. But a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So Isaiah's using it, talking about the disobedience of Israel, and as a result of that, uh, they're going to get into trouble because of the alliances that they make. They're not believing in God, but they're believing in their alliances, and they're gonna get into trouble as a result of that. So Jesus made it possible for both Jew and Gentile to be joined into one glorious house for God. To the disobedient Jew or Gentile, Christ is indeed a stone of stumbling. Think tripping whenever you think of stone of stumbling here. Uh, the, the Greek word means to uh, trip up. And of course, the next word we're very familiar with, uh, Petra skandalu, uh, we understand about scandals, don't we? About being scandalous or scandals. Um, Richard Nixon, scandal. You know, you think about this. Uh, follow the money and you're going to find out where he was uh, uh, really trying to cheat the American people and trying to win an election uh, as a result of his cheating and lying ways. Is that direct enough? <clears throat> Think trap. You're trying to trap somebody. Um, Jesus, if you reject him, becomes a trap. If you reject him, you trip over that cornerstone. So what Peter is trying to tell us here is we need to make sure that we are obedient, not disobedient, the same idea as rock of offense or rock a snare, which rock the Jews made a cause for stumbling. They stumbled over Jesus. He was right there. He was teaching. He was doing everything he was supposed to do. And they were so concerned about Rome coming in with their military and tearing apart the Jews, which of course are going to do uh, beginning in 66 AD anyway because of the Jewish revolt. But they're so concerned about them losing their uh, priority place in uh, the community that they just stumbled right over Jesus. Instead of accepting him, they fell over him. Uh, he became a trap for them because they wouldn't believe in him. So uh, the result is Jesus is our cornerstone. Jesus is the one that we believe in. But if we don't, then he becomes a stumbling rock. You fall down. But uh, a lot of times we need to get back up, those of us who do believe. But notice, Jesus can be both. He can be our savior, or you can trip over him like the Jews did and just try to ignore him or try to have him executed like they did. Um, notice the scripture says, disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. The word of God 
And this is why we talk about it so much. The word of God justifies the believer and convicts the disobedient. Just as those in Peter's present audience are characterized by their obedience to Jesus Christ, others are characterized by their disobedience. Some people are disobedient to the word. They should be doing what it says, but they make a conscious choice not to. That's what disobedience is. You know what is right and you do it what is wrong anyway. So the word of God justifies those who believe but they are convicting to those who are disobedient. <clears throat> Therefore, those who have obeyed are chosen. Remember when Peter used that, chapter two and verse four? If you obey, you're chosen, you're elect. <clears throat> it's not because you're so good, it's because Jesus was perfect and sinless. Destined for a glorious inheritance of heaven, those who have stumbled over and rejected Christ are bound for a devil's hell. And you think, boy, Swindoll, you're pretty direct here with this. This is the teaching. The question is, do we really believe it? People that are disobedient, people that are lost, are not going to heaven. And uh, I wonder how concerned we are about that sometimes, about people that we know should be doing right and they choose not to. Uh, where are they going? What's the end? You know, Jesus is going to give the ultimate victory to those of us who are obedient, but the ones who stumble and reject Christ, he's not going to be there for that ultimate victory. <clears throat> First Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen generation. This is the verse that everybody knows from First Peter chapter 2, chosen race, the King James says, chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, uh, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Everybody knows that verse. Preachers have used it forever. First Peter 2, 9, but you, notice the contrast here. This is a really important contrast. In contrast with the disobedient ones, you are chosen generation or race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, people that God owns. Um, you want more on that? Go back and read Romans chapter 6. Talks about we were once slaves to sin, now we're slaves to God and righteousness. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness. Sin, disobedience is darkness and you've been called into his marvelous light and we should be letting our light shine before men so they see our good works and glorify our father who is in heaven. We've been called into that marvelous light. Now we need to make sure that people see that light in us, letting your light shine. Peter lists a series of titles drawn from Old Testament, primarily from Isaiah 43, those passages, those uh, royal priesthood and that kind of thing, Exodus 19. They were once applied to Israel, but now they apply to uh, obedient Christians, okay? Uh, not much more we need to say about that, really. Uh, who once were a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I don't know about you. I don't want justice. How about you? You want justice from God? I don't want justice. I want him to show me that wonderful mercy that he has. Because even when we try our best to live as Christians, to do the right thing, to say the right things, we are going to stumble around fumble around and we're going to do things that are wrong and yet because we're walking in the light we're part of that marvelous light we're trying to let our light shine if we're doing the right thing God's going to give us mercy rather than justice I love the idea of God's mercy I hope you do as well uh, this by the way is a quote from Hosea 2:23. you've not received mercy but now you've received mercy this is a change from our former life when you had not received mercy, but in a single event of conversion, which you have received mercy. I really like this idea of a single event of conversion that takes place. Uh, we believe that entry point, 
Uh, I'll quit in just a minute. We believe that entry point, we uh, uh, repent of our sins, we confess Christ, and then somebody else baptizes us. Somebody else, we're passive in baptism. We stand in the baptistry, we confess Christ, and then whoever it is that's baptizing us puts us down into the water. We are passive in doing that. We're not active. We're not doing it to ourselves. We're not middle voice. We are passive. Somebody's doing it to us at that time. And that's that single event of conversion that we need to be able to look back on and remind ourselves, I made this choice and I did this. God said, if I was faithful, I will get the ultimate victory. Isn't that wonderful how Peter brings all this about? We're going to uh, stop right here because uh, one of the part gets a little bit detailed towards the end. We'll stop right here and we'll put together our, uh, our prayer list. <clears throat> I don't see if I have something to write with here. <clears throat>